Hello, everyone. On behalf of Delaware Public Media and the University of Delaware's Center for Political Communication, welcome to Delaware Debates 2020. I'm Ralph Begleiter. Delaware Debates is supported by the American Cancer Society's Cancer Action Network with the backing of the University of Delaware's College of Arts and Sciences and the offices of the provost and the president. We appreciate the candidates' participation during the coronavirus pandemic this year. For the first time, to protect everyone as much as possible, we're holding these debates virtually. The candidates are online from their own locations, and we here in the studio have been following all the precautions prescribed by public health officials and by the university. Because of the pandemic, there is no live audience here in the studio for this debate. As we've all learned during the pandemic, technology can be challenging, so I ask your patience, please, in the event we experience some glitches. This debate features candidates in the race for Delaware's single seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. The Democratic Party's nominee for Congress is Lisa Blunt Rochester, the incumbent. The Republican candidate for Congress is Lee Murphy. Welcome to both of you. Both candidates have agreed in advance to rules for this debate. I'll begin with a question for each of them, and they've agreed to hold their responses to time limits. We'll also include some questions recorded by students and Delaware citizens. Although there will be no opening statements, you will hear closing statements from both candidates later on. We'll keep our questions short and ask the candidates to answer concisely so we can cover more ground tonight. The candidates will answer in the order they determined with a pre-debate coin toss. Let's first focus on coronavirus pandemic-related questions, and my first question goes first to Lee Murphy. Mr. Murphy, the nation's black and brown populations suffered significantly higher rates of infection during the pandemic, especially in the food preparation uh, and food processing industry and in the prisons. Should the country have foreseen that, and what should Congress to do to prevent a recurrence of it the next time? Mr. Murphy? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I'd like to start by saying I am a COVID survivor. And early on in this process, uh, when the pandemic started, we really didn't know a whole lot here in this country. We had not a lot of information. Scientists and doctors disagreed, agreed uh, on different issues. China was silent. We got very little information from China. It's really hurt the Delaware economy. It's hurt our families emotionally, psychologically, in many ways. To address the prison problem and people of color, it's adversely affected them for sure. We need to prepare in the future. It's easy to go back and say that we should have done this and should have done that. But in the future, we can prepare for an a pandemic like this. We've learned a lot in the last six months since March. We have more information now. You know, it's time to reopen our schools. It's time to reopen our economy. I trust the people of Delaware to make decisions for their families and businesses to open safely. Our future in Delaware depends on reopening and reopening now. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, what have we learned uh, and how would you implement changes, if any, in the future to deal with the uh, disproportionate suffering of the black and brown population and the prison population? Well, first, thank you, Ralph, uh, for having me and to the University of Delaware and Delaware Public Media for this forum. Uh, secondly, I'd like to say to all of the Delawareans who have experienced COVID, um, whether it was through a family member or yourself, uh, like Mr. Murphy, um, my prayers and my heart are with you and my work is with you. I, I can say your first question was really about the disproportionate impact of people of color with this pandemic. And we have seen firsthand what we already knew. Many of us already knew that there were health disparities that existed and COVID-19 just shined a brighter life, light on it. The other thing that we do know, your part of your question was, whether or not um, we should have seen this coming. Uh, the Trump administration actually did things that did not prepare us, uh, one of which was making sure that the office that was tasked with looking at pandemics was actually shut down. The same is true with removing the person from China that 
was actually on the ground and could have provided information. There are things we could have done better, but in terms of health disparities, what we need to do is make sure as a country that we have testing, contact tracing, that we are putting people in isolation that need it and that they have treatment. Uh, this issue we know affects black and brown people disproportionately, but we need to also have the data and make sure we target our resources. Let me follow up briefly with both of you and ask you for a concise answer on this. Do you think Congress should take action on the question of the disproportionate effect on minority populations and on the food processing industry, or is this a state issue? Uh, Mr. Murphy, first. I firmly believe that this is a state issue, and I think each and every uh, state should handle this uh, in their own way, uh, and I think that would be more, much more effective than handling on a federal level. Congresswoman Blunt, Ro Blunt Rochester, your response to that? Well, two parts. One, you asked about what should be happening with food processing plants. And I do think um, there is a strong role for Congress to make sure that we are addressing things that, uh, particularly agriculture. I served on the Agriculture Committee, so that's important. But from a public health perspective, um, we are already taking a role. Uh, we are ready. The Congressional Black Caucus has taken a leadership role on making sure that we uh, address the issues of health disparities, everything from collecting the data. Initially, we weren't even collecting data on race when we looked at this pandemic. And so that was one of the things that I pushed for both here and in Washington. Also, again, making sure that the testing and the treatment is targeted. And then looking at issues like the, they call it the social determinants of health. Congresswoman, I'm going to, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. And, 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 but we are taking action right now. All right. I want to follow up on the COVID uh, situation and ask you both about the interaction between the federal government and the state governments. How would you rate President Trump's interaction with the states during the 2020 COVID-19 pandemic? Was the administration helpful to the states or hurtful to the states? And this question goes to Congresswoman Blunt Rochester first, please. You have a minute to answer. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. I think, first of all, um, the response is probably the, the greatest tragedy that we've seen. In terms of the working with states, what has happened is because of the lack of a national testing strategy, a national uh, response to this, what has happened is that states have had to compete against each other for things like PPE to help protect our workers. Um, the, the fact that we didn't use the Defense Production Act in the right way to make sure that we had the resources that we need and that we did it as a country is really a failure on the part of the administration. So, so if I were to grade um, the president on the handling of the pandemic, I, I would say he rated an F. And um, the one thing that he touts is that is the is the travel ban. And I'm glad that he can tout that. But there are so many other elements to this to ensure that we are both healthy, well, whole and economically sound. And he failed. Mr. Murphy, your response on the question of the federal state interaction during the pandemic? Uh, yeah, let's go back in history uh, a little bit. It's easy to armchair quarterback here as a congresswoman is doing. Uh, Back when the president instituted the travel ban, little was known about the coronavirus. And let's a, a little bit about history here. During that time in January, what was our country focused on? What was the Congress focused on? The Congress was focused on an impeachment that was founded on no basis, no evidence whatsoever. Who was talking about the pandemic? The administration was talking about the pandemic. They introduced the travel ban. The travel ban quite frankly, saved thousands, if not millions of lives in this country. It was an evolving process, this whole coronavirus. We knew little in January and February. It has evolved. The country has moved forward. The testing is throughout our country. We're at a time now in our history in this country where we have to reopen. The World Health Organization just said recently that shutting down our economy is not a way to end the pandemic. Mr. So Murphy, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop you there. Doesn't. I'm going to stop you there. You're going to get the first crack at the next question, which uh, you'll have a minute and a half to answer. Uh, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Affordable Care Act has been dominating this week's Senate hearings on replacing uh, the Supreme Court justice. And it'll be taken up by the Supreme Court uh, within a week or two uh, after the election. The question to you both is, what if the Supreme Court invalidates or strikes down the Affordable Care Act in the coming months? 
What would you, as a member of Congress, do about that? Mr. Murphy, first, a minute and a half, please. Yes, let's first of all clarify the Affordable Care Act for what it is. It's the Unaffordable Care Act. It has been proven to be ineffective for the majority of citizens in this country. Just yesterday, I talked to someone that had Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act. Their deductibles were almost $8,000. They paid a premium of $10,000 a year, a family that could not afford that. Do we need accessible health care for everybody in this country? Yes, we do. We have to make it affordable and accessible. But do we have to bankrupt the country? In my eyes, this Affordable Care Act is just one step for the Democrats in, to, to put their, in place their uh, Medicare for All program. We can't afford it. We can't afford it. We have to have a private industry where there's competition to drive down health care costs and drive down, drive down uh, costs for medicine for our people in this country. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, uh, the question about if the Supreme Court strikes down the Affordable Care Act, what would you do about that as a member of Congress? You, have a you know, you have. thank you so much for this question. This is probably one of the most important issues that we face right now. You know, first, I want to go back. Um, you know, Mr. Murphy said that, that we knew little about COVID-19. It is true, but the president knew a lot, and he actually said it on tape. And I think that's part of what is so unconscionable about it. Uh, and that's why he gets the F grade. On the Affordable Care Act, we all know this historic piece of legislation was something that allowed over 20 million people to have access to health care. This historic legislation was something that allowed people with pre-existing conditions like many of us to be able to not be afraid that they wouldn't be able to even get access to health care. This historic legislation allowed for young people to stay on their parents' health insurance. Uh, it, we could go through all of the incredible things that it did. No piece of legislation is perfect, but you don't throw it out. And what I've witnessed in my time in Congress is my Republican colleagues over and over talking about repeal and replace with no replacement. This is the worst time to get rid of health care during a pandemic. This is the worst time. We believe that health care should be a right and we believe, especially now during a pandemic, everyone should have access and we should fight to make it affordable, which is what I've been doing in Congress. All right, a brief follow up for both of you, and I'm going to ask you to, to answer in 30 seconds or so, please. If the court does strike it down, what do you do about the millions who, with Affordable Care Act off the books, no longer in the law, what do you do about the people who will have lost their health care? Mr. Murphy, you first, please, 30 seconds. Yeah, obviously, we have to have a plan that we can put in in place to cover the people that need to be covered while we come up with a better plan, a more effective, a more cost effective plan. One that affords health care to all people at a nominal cost where they are really covered, where they don't have to go broke, where they don't have to spend their life savings to pay the premiums and pay the deductibles. We have to put in place a com competition in this country competition across state lines where people can shop for the best possible price for their health care and the best health care that they can have. Right here in Delaware, we have a situation where we have one health care provider, just one. There's absolutely no competition here in our state of Delaware. Why do we have the highest per patient cost per patient in the country? Right Mr. here Murphy, in Delaware, we need competition. I'm, I'm going to stop you again. I'm afraid you've gone over your time. Uh, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, about 30 seconds, please. If the Supreme Court uh, invalidates the Affordable Care Act, what do you do about those who lose their coverage right away? First of all, Ralph, I'm glad you asked that question because it's a question that I have not heard one Republican answer. Um, to me, we fight for the Affordable Care Act, number one. In addition to that, it, we're looking at giving people the opportunity to choose a public option. And so to me, again, the focus should not be on taking away health care from people. It should be expanding the Affordable Care Act and making it more affordable and accessible to more people, not less. I'd love to hear what the plan is. I, I, I'd love to hear it. All right. Now, to both of you, uh, and this is all staying on the domestic issues uh, front, during the coronavirus pandemic, 
both parties in Congress seem effectively to have abandoned their previous concern about controlling or reducing the federal debt, the federal deficit. What implications will that have for the American economy in the future? I'll ask each of you to answer in about a minute, and Congressman Blunt Rochester, first, please. Thank you so much. You know, I think, first of all, let's just say in Delaware, we know the importance of making sure that we have balanced budgets. And when I went to Congress in my first term, I was presented with the opportunity to vote for a tax cut bill that really supported the richest corporations and individuals and, um, and also ballooned the debt. Now, in this current situation with this pandemic, the reason why we are fighting to make sure there, there's an investment in our, in our economy is because people like Jerome Powell, the Fed chairman, said that we are at risk from doing too little, not too much, to deal with this pandemic and to deal with our economy, which is why I have supported the CARES Act and the HEROES Act and bills that will put the stimulus dollars back into the hands of the American people, as well as support our businesses. Right now, we are in a pandemic. We are in a crisis, and a crisis requires big, bold action. And that's why we need to support the HEROES Act, as well as support our businesses. Mr. Murphy, your opportunity to answer in about a minute the implications of the apparent abandonment of concern about the federal deficit. Uh, yeah. As we know, uh, Ralph, it's Congress's job to spend tax dollars wisely. Uh, a deficit is when Congress spends more money than they bring in in tax revenue. Uh, the deficit is too high. We all know that. Uh, there's two ways to fix the deficit. We cut spending. We increase taxes. My opponent wants to increase your taxes. She wants to increase your taxes, taxes drastically. I'd like to see that we decrease income tax rates, create a vibrant economy where more people are working. More people are paying taxes. We create a bigger tax base. Now, number two, spending. Now, there's good spending and bad spending. Medicare, Social Security are examples of good spending. What's an example of bad spending is what my opponent voted for in the CARES Act, a bill packed with pork, unnecessary spending with money that was totally not needed in that bill. Okay, quick follow-up, Mr. Murphy, then. Would you have voted against the CARES Act in the middle of the pandemic had you been in Congress? No, I certainly would have voted for a bill that was directed to help the American people in times, tough times. And for, for no reason, uh, people lost their jobs for no fault, through no fault of their own. Of course, I would have voted for a bill that would have helped those people, all Americans. But I'm not going to stand by and watch somebody pour, fill it with pork, a bill with all unnecessary spending, a wasting of taxpayers' dollars, just in the name of getting a bill across the finish line that really cost the American taxpayers millions and billions of dollars. Okay, and Congresswoman, <laughs> uh, a follow-up for you. Uh, do you think the absence of concern over the deficit is sort of the new normal for the United States now? Can I respond to his question? Yes, and by all means, do, please. Uh, because what, what uh, Mr. Murphy said is that uh, I um, am basically going to just tax more people. The option that you didn't mention in your two is to tax the wealthiest, that 1% that got a big tax break at the expense of the rest of the American people. That's number one. And in terms of the CARES Act, I am so proud that Democrats, independents, and Republicans stepped up together overwhelmingly to pass the CARES Act. It allowed for people to have stimulus checks. It allowed for people to have paid sick time. It allowed for our frontline workers to have PPE. There is nothing that I, I can tell you, it was one of the proudest my, uh, moments of mine is to see us as a country come together. Okay. And that's what we need to do now. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'm gonna to turn to a, a slightly different topic now. Um, I wanna ask you both whether Congress should take concrete steps to limit the authority and finances of police units to prevent police brutality. What steps do you favor to try to curta curtail police brutality? And you each have a minute and a half to respond to this, and I'll ask Lee Murphy to answer first, please. As we know that uh, uh, in our country that we uh, 
we do. There are instances of police brutality in our country. And these issues have to be addressed. And they will be addressed. All people that break the law need to be held responsible and be fully prosecuted under the law for their wrongdoing. In this country right now, we have a lot of racial unrest. We have people on both sides, protesters, police. My opponent, through her silence, basically wants to defund the police. I support the police. They should be fully funded. If we're going to solve this problem that we face in our country, the racial injustice, both sides have to work together. Both sides have to come together. The police are an important part of that equation. We have to work together. We cannot. We cannot. Because of a few people, a few bad apples, we cannot turn, our, turn on our police. They need to be fully funded. We need a police force. We need to pull up. We need to protect the most vulnerable people in our communities. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, your, uh, your comments on the question of whether concrete steps should be taken by Congress to limit uh, the finances of police units to prevent police brutality. Well, first of all, I would say that um, George Floyd's murder um, and people having seen it firsthand, eyewitnessing it, I think was a wake-up call to many people. And there's a line that uh, Senator Kamala Harris says that Bad cops are bad for good cops. And I think that's true. What we have been able to do in Washington is actually pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which deals with accountability, transparency, and training. In addition, here at home, you know, we know that a, a bill in Congress sometimes takes time. And while we were able to get the support in the House, um, I want people to know that there are still efforts being made in the Senate, in a bipartisan way. It's not on the news, but people are still working. But here at home, I've been able to work as well. I come at this from different perspectives. Number one, as a mother of a black son who actually did uh, have to jump out of the bed when she, her son called from being stopped by the police. But I also come at it from the perspective of a Delawarean who has worked with law enforcement over the years and who has worked with the community. And so recently, I've been combining people, bringing people together, both law enforcement as well as community to talk about body cameras for the state of Delaware so that every single law enforcement officer here would have body cameras. It is something the police wants. It is something that the community wants. It is something that we can do together. All right. I'd like to follow up with both of you. A brief answer, please, maybe 30 seconds or so. Would either of you or both of you want to curtail the supply of military grade equipment from the Defense Department to local police forces? Congresswoman, first, please. You know, th this is an important question because I've heard examples where people have shared that they had equipment that helped them in different instances. But the challenge that we have now is that these uh, this military equipment is just going out to different departments. People aren't properly trained. They don't need it. These, these kinds of things. And so um, as part of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, there is a limitation on using these military grade style things. You don't, you don't need a, 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 a bazooka when you're in a neighborhood. That's just not appropriate. Uh, back to good training, good accountability, and good transparency. Mr. Murphy, up to you now, about 30 seconds. Military grade equipment to local police departments. Yeah, uh, first of all, I don't think the uh, police departments, any police departments across the United States use uh, bazookas, quite frankly, that I don't think that's, um, I don't think they're used. But the military grade equipment, uh, if the police department, I would leave this up to the police department. If they see fit for a certain piece of equipment to protect all their citizens in a better way, I say that the leave it up to the police p chiefs, leave it up to the police departments to make those final decisions. I don't think any police department it's going to use military-grade equipment to go out and uh, obliterate a neighborhood. I think they're going to use, they're, they will use it if needed to protect the citizens of their communities. So I, we, we need to leave it up to the police department. All right. And now I'm going to ask both of you, I'm going to ask both of you to kind of step back for a minute and for a kind of bigger picture question that comes from a University of Delaware student. I'll ask you to listen carefully because it's a short question. 
Hi, my name is Julie Wallace. I'm a senior communications and political science major. And my question is, do you think that the checks and balances system established by our founders is working? Okay, is checks and balances working in, in Washington these days? I'll ask each of you to respond in about a minute. And uh, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester first, please. Julie, what a great question. You know, I think a lot of times people are really concerned right now about what they're seeing. Um, it's why one of my most important, I think one of my most important roles is also to give people hope in terms of the things that do work and are working, that the majority of bills that we pass in the House, we've sent over hundreds of bipartisan bills to the Senate. Um, we also know that we have challenges right now as we're looking at our court system versus the White House versus Congress is part of what it is to be a democracy. But I do think what works most is the American people. Whether you vote, whether you participate, um, that is the thing that keeps us uh, in check and in balance. And so I would just encourage you, Julie, um, to be a part of the process. I thank you for your question. And I, I think I do think checks and balances work, but it works best when all of us participate. Lee Murphy, your response on checks and balances, please, about 30 seconds. I'm sorry, about a minute. Okay, Julie, uh, thanks for the question. And when I was in college, uh, uh, the checks and balances in our government did work and worked quite effectively. Uh, today in our polarized political uh, society, uh, the checks and balances uh, are, are not quite frankly working. Uh, we have a stalemate. We have a Congress that will not work with the President of the United States, a House of Representatives that has made it clear that they not only don't want to work with our President, they want to impeach the President of the United States based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. So that system of checks and balances, as you can, if you're watching the Supreme Court uh, nomination hearings currently, uh, it's one side against the other side. And it is polarized, and the checks and balances are really not in effect in our political system today. All right. Uh, another follow-up along those lines. There was a time, not too long ago, when Congress spent most of its time crafting legislation, passing bills. Some of them were signed by presidents. Some of them were not signed by presidents. But policy was being made in Congress. I'd like to ask each of you, in about 30 seconds or so, do you foresee circumstances under which Congress, both the House and the Senate, return to their roles of passing legislation uh, and, and creating public policy? And I'll ask uh, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester to respond first, please. I, I really do have to push back and say, we do pass bills. We do pass legislation. There are, there are things that we do in a bipartisan way. Everything from mental health protections to uh, dealing with the opioid crisis to uh, passing legislation. Just recently, we just passed a continuing resolution bipartisan to make sure that our government stays open. And so I don't want there to be this false impression that everything that you see on the news is representative of what happens on the House floor. I am proud that when I go into those committee meetings, I can represent Delaware and we can talk about issues of climate change and that there have been opportunities where I've been able to bring people together on both sides of the aisle to work on issues, even as recent as the farm bill okay. for our farmers in, in, in Delaware. So and Lee Murphy, your comment on the question of passing legislation in both houses of Congress? Yeah, that would be great. It's nice when legislation passes one house, but if it's not acceptable to the other house, uh, it, it just doesn't go anywhere. And the, the bills and, and the legislation that benefits the American people quite frankly, right now is not going anywhere. If it if it's passed in the Senate, it doesn't pass in the House. If it passes in the House, it doesn't pass in the Senate. And why is that? Let's get to the root of the problem right here. Okay. They the 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 part the Democrats, quite frankly, do not want our president reelected. It's been one thing after another. When Congress spends 85, 90 percent of their time on investigation after investigation after investigation. Is there is it any wonder nothing gets accomplished for the American people? All right. I'm going to I'm going to stop you there and move on to some questions. You know, we're only a few weeks away from a, a major election, and I'd like to focus on some election related topics. The U.S. Postal Service has been operating at a loss for a very long time. 
That came to a head over the summer when President Trump's appointed Postmaster General implemented major cuts in equipment and personnel to process postal mail just before the election. And several courts have intervened since then. The question for you is, should the Postal Service be reformed? And if so, how? And Mr. Murphy, you get uh, the first crack at this, and I'll ask each of you to take about a minute 30 to answer this question. Yeah, first of all, I think the post office, I think the post office does a great job. I think the postal workers uh, are hardworking people, blue collar people, workers that do a fantastic job. Now they're burdened with the fact that we have uh, vote by mail, which I totally uh, am opposed to. Uh, we, I think it's a situation where uh, it's open to fraud. Uh, our election process, the integrity of our election process is really the bedrock of our democracy. Uh, we have a situation, we have a, 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 a absentee ballot uh, format in place where people who cannot go to the polls can vote uh, and vote safely. Uh, I just feel that with mail-in ballots, it just opens up uh, a whole, whole can of worms where uh, people's votes will not be counted. And the most important part of our electoral system, elect, our election system, is the integrity of this system. And I, I just think mailing in ballots, and I hear it every day from voters out there, they're getting ballots at their home from people that don't live there uh, or people that have passed away, quite frankly. Uh, we need to get back. People need to go to the polls and vote. We have a system, absentee ballots, if people want to vote and not go to the, go to the polls. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, uh, should the Postal Service be reformed? And if so, how? You know, I, I want to first start by saying that um, Mr. Murphy brought up the impeachment of the president. And I will say as a Delawarean and the sole representative of Delaware, I am always um, cognizant of the fact that I represent a whole state, Democrats, Republicans, and independents. And so one of the hardest decisions was to evaluate the information that was before Congress and make a decision about the impeachment of the, of the president. That was a very important vote. I even called my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Quinn, because it was during Watergate that I remember as a child the confidence that, that President Nixon just withdrew from the people. The post office, the postal service is a perfect example of this president's abuse of power. He has personal feelings about the postal service. He's appointed people to like, like Postmaster DeJoy who are, are, are big fundraisers and donors for him and in an effort to depress the vote. This is a basic in America. The Postal Service is one of the highest rated trusted entities in government. And then to tamper with them and to tamper with our vote, I think is shameless, shameless. Continuing on some questions about the election process, are you, are you confident, both of you, that foreign nations and other actors, domestic and international, are not meddling in the 2020 elections? And what, if anything, should Congress do about this? I'll ask each of you to respond in about a minute. And Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, please take it first. Uh, your question is a great one. We know that the Russians tampered in the 2016 election. And a Senate Republican report, bipartisan report, actually said that they're tampering now. But the question is, what did the president do about it? What has Mitch McConnell and the Senate done about it? We as on the, in the House, have actually, as part of the HEROES Act and the previous bills that were passed in a bipartisan way, actually put in funding to protect our elections from tampering. The good news is I can tell you that here in Delaware, uh, uh, over a year ago, I actually had an opportunity to sit down with folks from Homeland Security, from our, our chief information officer, as well as Department of Elections, to make sure that our election systems we're safe and secure. I would encourage people to vote in any way possible that you can, but vote, get your ballot now, vote early. This is the most important election of our lifetime. And we have to make sure that you are safe and secure when you go to the poll or if you should do mail-in. Do it, do it, do it. Vote, 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 however it works best for you. 
Lee Murphy, your response on the question about whether you're confident that foreign nations and other foreign actors are not uh, meddling in the 2020 election. Well, I think I would be naive not to, to say that I don't think our enemies are meddling in our elections. Uh, they want certain outcomes in this upcoming presidential elec election. Uh, there's no secret that uh, they want certain uh, people to be elected. Uh, it's our job in this country with our security system to, to prevent that meddling in our elections. But I, I, quite frankly, I think that the, the greatest threat to our election uh, really comes from within right now. And with the question of mail-in ballots uh, in courts all over the United States, the, the opportunity for fraud in this upcoming election, the, the, the opportunity for it to be settled in a court of law, I think the greatest threat is right here in the United States, and we should deal with that instead of and also worry about foreign interference. Here's a follow-up question to those on the, on the elections from a junior at the Uni University of Delaware, Nick Kilmer. Please listen carefully. What can be done to prevent cyber attacks on citizens in our government? Okay, question about cybersecurity and cyber attacks. I'll give each of you about a minute to respond, and Lee Murphy, you take it first, please. Well, what can be done is that our, our national security system really needs to be on top of that and prevent those things from happening. Uh, that is their responsibility, and our intelligence agencies also need to prevent that from happening. And Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, cybersecurity? You know, uh, Nick, that is a, a great question because many of us are very much concerned about our cybersecurity. Um, and it, it affects not just us as individuals, it affects our businesses, it affects our ability to even uh, live, work, and play. And so I want to first off start by saying that, um, yes, we need to make sure that we're investing in our, in, in making sure that our infrastructure is safe and secure. Um, and that's everything from our power grids to, to, to our elections. Um, in addition to that, um, that means we're going to also have to vote on pieces of legislation in a bipartisan way that focus on what's in the best interest of all of us. The other piece I would also add is that just as an individual, something we don't talk a lot about is good cyber hygiene. I think a lot of us have learned a lot over these past few years about how we, we personally can be hacked, how our accounts can be hacked. And so both as an individual and us in government can help to make sure that we have secure and safe uh, not just infrastructure, but society, elections, and, and the like. I'd like to turn and ask your, uh, you to turn your attention now to some environmental questions. I want to ask you whether Congress should take steps to limit home building and rebuilding in areas that are threatened by climate change, rising sea levels, wildfires, violent hurricanes, and so on. If Congress should act, what kinds of steps should be taken? Should banks and insurance companies, for instance, and the federal government itself continue to underwrite such construction in those zones? I'll ask you to, to answer, please, in about one minute and 30 seconds. And Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, you take it first, please. Thank you. You know, I actually, uh, this term, was able to get on the Energy and Commerce Committee in Congress. It's an exclusive committee, and it was one that really touched Delawareans. I'm on the health subcommittee, and that was important, number one issue for Delawareans. But I'm also on the environment and climate change subcommittee. And what I can tell you is that as a country, it's not just what we see in terms of wildfires and things across the country. It's what we see right here at home, that climate change is real. We see it on our beaches when a storm comes. We see it for our farmers as they're trying to plan and plant. And we also see it in environmental justice communities when it rains and they see flooding. So some of the actions that we have taken in Congress, um, I've actually uh, focused on issues of energy efficiency. If we're going to have buildings that um, are government-run buildings, they should be energy efficient. That creates jobs. It also helps to ensure that we have a better quality of life and impacts our health. And so for me, I think the role of government is to make sure that we provide the right um, incentives for local governments and, and organizations and companies to be able to, in Joe Biden's words, build back better 
um, and that we do it in a way that is environmentally friendly and that actually does address our economic challenges as well as our health challenges. Lee Murphy, to you, should banks, insurance companies, and even the federal government continue to underwrite construction in threatened zones like coastal Delaware? Well, I don't think it's the responsibility of the government to underwrite those kinds of projects. I think it should be left up to the individuals that want to live in those areas. It should be strictly up to them if they want to stay there. And if for whatever reason, if it's insurance or whatever, they need to pay the price to live in those areas. I think the federal government should not underwrite uh, those individuals or those businesses who choose to live in areas threatened by uh, our environment. Would you stop the federal flood insurance program then, which is underwritten by the federal government? No, I would not stop the federal uh, flood insurance program. I have many friends in New Orleans that were affected by, affected by Hurricane Katrina back in 2005. And quite frankly, that program really saved and helped a lot of people during that difficult time. Uh, Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, follow up to you. You didn't really tackle the question of what steps should be taken, if any, uh, by Congress to uh, deal with federal investment and insurance investment and bank investment in areas that are threatened. Yeah, I did. My, my response is that you know, our role should really be incentivizing those kinds of um, environmentally friendly buildings, as well as um, my work even here. And as, as uh, Lee was talking, I thought about one of the first bills that I was actually uh, able to get turned into a law, which was a bipartisan bill that with one of my Republican colleagues from Florida, we were able to make sure that the maps, the coastal maps, were drawn correctly so that Delawareans who would not normally be eligible for flood insurance could be. But that was something that came from a Delawarean that we were able to turn into a law. And so um, my, again, I come from the perspective of let's provide incentives to make sure that we deal with our environment. All right, speaking of incentives, I'm gonna ask you whether the federal government should continue or increase incentives for renewable energy projects, such as the wind farm that's already been approved off the coast of Delaware and Maryland, or for electric vehicles or reducing dependence on coal. How much weight should the federal government put behind these kinds of initiatives? And I'll ask uh, each of you to respond in about a minute. And Lee Murphy, please answer first. Now, first of all, I think these should be local decisions. Uh, uh, for solar and, and, and water power. Uh, federally, it needs to be on a local level. Uh, I support clean air and clean water uh, and the EPA. Uh, however, that uh, I wanna bring it down to the state level. I think they can administrate it uh, in a much more effective fashion. And Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, question was- uh, uh, I, go ahead. I, think we, I think we need to put our money where our mouth is. If we say, that we value a clean energy uh, uh, economy, if we say that we recognize that climate change is real, then we should be providing incentives. We should be actually looking at this as an opportunity, an economic opportunity to provide jobs to people. Putting up these uh, uh, the, um, the stations to be able to deal with those, with uh, electric cars, putting solar panels on homes. These are, these are jobs, you know, and as Delaware's former secretary of labor, even seeing what we're doing at our own Delaware, Dell Tech, our community college, where we're training people for the jobs of the future. This is a win-win. We incentivize because it pays back dividends to our economy. It's not a feel good, it's a do good, and it will be good for all of us. Uh, Mr. Murphy, I'd like to follow up on your response for just a moment. You, you spoke about supporting uh, energy initiatives by the federal government. And you've told votesmart.org in the past that you uh, think the Department of Energy should continue its major role in funding research on uh, carbon capture and storage technology. And yet in your answer tonight, you spoke about it being local decisions or state decisions. Can you reconcile those for me, please? About 30 seconds. Yes, uh, on the federal level, research uh, only. Um, I, I wanna just, get back to, to one point, uh, I'm in favor of all types of energy and all types of energy research. But as uh, the other party advocates, they want to do away with the oil and gas industry overnight. 
uh, we're talking about thousands and thousands of jobs in the oil and gas industry. Uh, and these jobs, the inter- we are energy efficient in our country for the first time in many, many, many decades. We have to continue to explore other means of energy production, but at the same time, we have to continue to produce oil and gas in our country to serve the needs of the citizens of this country. Congresswoman, do you want to comment on that question of federal investment? Go ahead. Yeah, I do. I, I you know, uh, first of all, I want to um, say that I've not heard any of my colleagues say that, you know, we're going to flip a switch and get rid of oil and gas o- overnight. But I can tell you what I have heard. I've heard from many young people in our state who are scared to death that there will not be a planet for them. So, yes, I do believe in a bold, um, a comprehensive with a sense of urgency, uh, plan to move us forward with renewable energy, with a go- with goals getting us back into the Paris Climate Accord. These are important things because we are connected as a world. And like I said, if nothing else, young people, older people like me, <laughs> we we know that this is our planet, and we oh, have to say. Okay, Congresswoman, I'm sorry. I'm I'm going to interrupt you now and 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 move on. I do want to ask a question related to the Internet's ubiquitous role in our life. Uh, And this question actually comes from a University of Delaware senior, Maisie Cutler. Do you think social media should be held accountable for their content and how should that be enforced? Should social media be held accountable for their content and how would you enforce that? I'll ask you each to take a minute and a half to discuss that question. And Congresswoman, you take it first, please. Thank you. Thank you, Maisie, for the question. You know, this is probably one of the um, one of the, the the biggest issues that we're dealing with as well in our committee on energy and commerce. We've actually just about a few weeks ago had a panel of individuals talk about the impact of social media and on on everything, everything from our mental health and, and bullying to voter suppression, as we saw in the 2016 election, where black folks, where veterans were specifically targeted with misinformation. And so um, number one, it is a real and ever present danger. While we do know that social media has also been able to, you know, help move movements and also do good things. There has to be a balance. I have actually been able to lead a letter because one of the biggest culprits of this is Facebook. And I've been able to lead a letter to Mark Zuckerberg to basically say two things. Number one, you need to look at the content. We need to make sure that that there isn't misinformation. And I'm glad to see folks are taking steps. And number two, we need to make sure that there is a diversification of folks who are um, behind the scenes in these social media companies, because that's that's how we see some of this misinformation that gets passed and gets it gets shared. And so I do think that there is a role for Congress to hold these uh, these social media platforms accountable. And that's something that I'm working on on the Energy and Commerce Committee. Mr. Murphy, your comment on the question of whether social media firms should be held accountable for the content of what they send out. uh, Social media today is a major source of information for all of us. Uh, Like anything else, it can be used for good, it can be used for bad. Even in my campaign, I've experienced uh, censorship on social media. Uh, During the primary election, we put out a Uh, information where polling places were uh, supposed to be open and they were closed. Uh, We were shut down on Facebook because they considered our content was uh, ill-informed and not right. Uh, So I've experienced the censorship. Uh, You know, it's, it's a, it's a thorny problem. We don't want to stifle business yet. uh, And especially private enterprise, we don't want to stifle private enterprise, but we have to make, the leaders of social media, of these gigantic companies, they have to be responsible for their actions. And they hold, uh, basically right now, they can put out what they want and control what they don't want to put out. Uh, It's a tough problem. And especially for younger people today, uh, social media is their entire world. And uh, I have two young grandchildren and uh, we, we curtail their social media activity. And uh, personally, I probably use social media too much myself. So it's people have to be accountable. 
the Googles of the world and the Facebooks of the world have to be accountable and the content has to be fair. All right, thank you both for that. Um, I think there's just enough time for a couple of what we call lightning round questions, short questions that require shorter answers. I'm gonna ask you to respond uh, in about a minute to this one. Should federal law protect individuals' rights to choose their own gender? And if so, or if not, should states be involved in making that question, uh, deciding that question, or is that a federal question to be responded to? And Congresswoman, I'll ask you to respond first, please, about a minute. Well, I, I'm not sure if I quite understood your question, but I can say this. Um, no one should be discriminated against based on their uh, sexual uh, orientation, based on race, based on gender. No one should be discriminated against. That's number one. Number two, I think that people, um, this, this past Sunday was the 32nd anniversary of the of National Coming Out Day. And I know that there are a lot of my family and friends in the LGBTQ community who are concerned and scared about the rollbacks that this administration has taken on everything from their health care um, to their ability to serve in the military. And so my message is that I will continue to fight for all Delawareans. We're fortunate right now that we even have three individuals in our state that are going to be making history from that community, those communities. And so um, love is love. We don't wanna see anybody discriminated against and I will continue to fight for all of all Delawareans. Mr. Murphy, question about whether individuals should have the right to choose their own gender and is that a state or a federal question? Well, we all have equal rights under the 14th Amendment. Uh, uh, sexual identity issues need really to be addressed by families. Uh, under the Equality Act, uh, people's beliefs about sexual identity are turned into a protected class. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, federal government can impose penalties on anyone who disagrees with uh, this ideology. Uh, local authorities lose authority. Uh, for instance, a coach on a sports team uh, would lose the authority to uh, allow certain people to play on that, that team. Uh, as a former coach of girls' sports and athletics, uh, I do not really advocate I'd like to make a decision who plays on my team. And I do not want a male who identifies as a female to play on my particular girl's team. It destroys women's sports. Our last very short question comes from a UD student, Mia Carbone. It is short, so listen carefully, please, and then I'll, I'll ask you to respond. Hello, my name is Emma Gogol. I am a junior political science student at the University of Delaware. And my question is, do you support the right to an abortion as protected by Roe v. Wade? Okay, support of right to abortion. I apologize for misidentifying Emma uh, in that question. And I'll ask uh, Mr. Murphy to take that question first, please. About a minute to respond. Yes, I am uh, personally pro-life. Uh, I will protect life from the womb to natural death. Uh, the uh, current law that we have in this country, uh, as a congressman, I will uphold the laws of this country. I will be sworn to do so. Uh, the abortion question has really come to light lately in terms of late-term abortion and abortion at birth, which I just think is horrible. Uh, I will protect life, and I will uphold life, and uphold the laws of this country. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester, your response on the Roe v. Wade question? My answer is uh, unequivocal. I support a woman's right to choose. It is a decision between she and her doctor, and if she believes in God, her God. Um, I don't think that this is a role that government should have in, in, a, in a woman's life. And um, I, 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 that was a short question. That's my short answer. I support Roe v. Wade, and that is also why elections matter. That is why it matters what happens in the Senate in terms of confirmation, even of Supreme Court justices, that we make sure that we uphold the law. And so, yes, I support a woman's right to choose. 
All right, and I'm afraid that concludes our time available for Q&A during the debate. So I want to give both of you a chance to offer our viewers your concluding thoughts, your closing statements, each limited to two minutes, please. And we'll start, as you agreed previously, with Lee Murphy for a closing statement. Thanks for having me this evening, and uh, I've really enjoyed the debate. You know, 60 years ago to uh, the day, actually, uh, as a little boy, I sat on my living room floor with my two brothers, and we anxiously awaited the first televised Kennedy-Nixon debate. Uh, back in the 1960s, uh, were a, a lot like uh, what we face today. Our nation faced uh, ra racial problems throughout the country. Uh, our economy was not in good shape. And there was a war looming in far off Southeast Asia. Uh, the two people that ran for president that year, a young man named John F. Kennedy, stood up and told us about a future, a bright future for a new generation of Americans. And I was inspired by that. And he went on to say that there isn't anything that we can't do as a country. We live in the greatest country in the world. And we're only limited by our imagination. Well, we still are a great country. And we still have great potential. But it's going to take leadership to get our country and our state back on track. Now, our state, under the Congresswoman, has languished at the bottom economically behind all the states in our country. We need to get our state going again economically. We need to bring manufacturing jobs back to this country. We need to have a vibrant middle class in Delaware. You've only got a couple seconds left. So I thank you for this evening and I seek your support on November 3rd. All right, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester, your closing statement, please. Well, first, thank you, Ralph. Thank you to my alma mater, University of Delaware. Thank you to Delaware Public Media for hosting this forum. And thank you to Mr. Murphy for stepping up like many Americans are doing today. I, um, I will tell you, serving you in Congress has been the honor of my life. It has been four years. And in that time, we have faced a presidential impeachment, the longest government shutdown, a pandemic, and a racial reckoning. And I can tell you, we have also been able to face some of the greatest, greatest opportunities to work together with my colleagues on things such as um, making sure that we passed the farm bill to protect our farmers, making sure that we came together as a country to deal with this pandemic. And also um, for me personally, just to serve Delawareans my team, my staff, I wanna say thank you to them for everything that they do, especially during this pandemic. I actually asked them the other day, what are some of the things that they are proud of in the work that we've done? And I heard everything from the hundreds of thousands of dollars that we were able to recoup for Delawareans that needed a social security check or had problems with the IRS and we were able to solve those problems to the $1.6 million that we were able to get out of the Provider Relief Fund for Nanticoke Hospital or the work with Delaware State University. It has been my honor and my privilege to serve you, but I know there is so much more to do. I know that hopefully with a Joe Biden uh, administration, we will be able to tackle this pandemic. We will be able to build our economy back better and we will be able to unite. So, Tonight, I hope that I have served you well. I hope that I have made you proud. And I hope that I have your vote on November 3rd. Thank you, Delaware. Congresswoman Blunt Rochester and Mr. Murphy, thank you both for participating in Delaware Debates 2020. On behalf of Delaware Public Media and the University of Delaware's Center for Political Communication, thank you all for watching Delaware Debates. I'm Ralph Begleiter, encouraging you to vote on or before Tuesday, November 3rd.